I remember there was this girl, like the school bully, kind of just tried to make my life hell for months. So she said like, no, like hit me, like try and hit me, you know, I'm not here to mess around. Uh, world, having a world title and being sat here with a belt one day would be amazing, but that's like having a direct impact on an individual's life. For me, a big thing is inspiring the younger generation and kind of getting my story out for kids to see and realise that it doesn't matter what happens to you in life, you can have hardships, you can have bad times, you can feel lost and lonely and that you don't fit in, but not fitting in is often a good thing. It's good to be different. Your winner, Georgia O'Connor. So today we are joined by professional boxer Georgia O'Connor. Georgia, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Very glad to have you here in uh, in my home. Thank you for coming. How are you? I'm good. Uh, it's, I know it's been a while to actually make this happen. We've always missed each other and stuff like that. Um, but first and foremost, for the people who can't see this place, we're literally situated in a lovely big house in the middle of, is it like County Durham area? We're like West Durham. Yeah. West Durham. Um, we're in the hills. I can literally see, it's it's unbelievable. As far as the eye can see, it's just green, which is class. Really nice. Um Obviously, for the people who don't know who you are, and I don't want to ask the normal questions like, oh, tell us a little bit about yourself, but where did you grow up and how did you get introduced to boxing? So, obviously, I was born in Durham. Um, I spent most of my life here. I lived in France briefly as a child. Um, I was lucky enough to, my dad, well, my dad was lucky enough to be in a position to kind of retire for four years and uh, watch me grow up before starting school. Um, I went to France, lived there for a bit. Uh, came back because my mum, bless her, she was homesick and missed her mum at the time. Uh, came back here. I had a wonderful childhood. Um, I started boxing, probably getting into martial arts and fighting sports. I think I was three. Uh, I couldn't even walk properly. I was a late bit of a late walker, but I uh, was doing pads with my dad and uh, playing like silly games. And like he was trying to get me to hit them and stuff. And so you could say I've always been involved in fighting sports, but. Um, my family aren't really like, they don't want me to be a superstar. They were never like that, you know, pushing their kind of dreams, their unfulfilled, unfulfilled dreams onto me. My dad just wanted me to be able to look after myself. Being a woman in today's world, um, you know, the world sometimes is not a very nice place. And I think he was a bit worried that something might happen to me and I'd be put in a situation where I'd be forced to defend myself. So for that, he thought, right, I want to get her into martial arts, defend herself. And it's just all led to where I am today which I'm really grateful for that's amazing that you've got a dad like that because obviously I've met your dad um top fella and I think it's amazing that you've got that support because I've got a little one a little girl and I know that I would love it again to some kind of whatever it was some kind of martial art would be lovely to so she could defend herself because it is like the world can be a very cruel place and I think to have that skill as a female it's not something you see all the time um I think it'd be really you know it's a, it's a, it's a nice thing to have around you um, was it all from your dad where you got that support or did your mum want that as well? My mum as well, of course, but my mum's got definitely got more of a soft side than my dad. My mum's a bit more like emotional than my dad. Um, she'll cry at things easier, you know, sad movies on the telly where my dad will like kind of roll his eyes. My mum gets emotional. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of like a mix between the two. So I've got my stubborn kind of So you roll side. your eyes and get emotional. Yeah, basically, <laughs> right. yeah. So yeah, it was definitely more from my dad, I think, who wanted me to do that. But obviously my mum as well. Can you remember kind of getting into school and stuff? Did you ever have to use the skills that you'd kind of picked up? Um, not in primary school. Primary school was kind of very chill, very quiet. Um, I went to a very small primary school. I think there was, when I was there, there was like 70 kids in the whole school. So wow. everyone knew everyone. It was like a lovely little community. Um, secondary school was a bit of a different story. Um, my first secondary school, I hated it. I kind of got really bad anxiety, separation anxiety from my parents going there because my mum taught in my primary school as well. So I ah, kind of had right. her, like, oh, she was there, like, throughout my whole school just, life. So yeah, before yeah. school, after school, exactly. and in school. Yeah. So it was a big change going to secondary school. And uh, I remember there was this girl, like the school bully, kind of just tried to make my life hell for months. And I'm not the type of person that's easily angered. You know, I can put up with stuff and just let it wash over my head. I've always said, like, you can say what you want about me. I'm not bothered. I'm confident enough in myself. I know what I am. But it's when you start making comments about my family and those that I love. And this girl made a comment about my mum and I just lost it. So it wasn't really self-defence. I kind when of lashed you, when out. When you lost her, what did you do? Just tee off on her? Pretty much, yeah. Really? Like, just give her a swift jab to the head in the changing rooms. <laughs> yeah. Swift jab. Yeah. I mean, it's not something that <laughs> How I... How old were you, by the way, at this point? Uh, just turned 12. Right. Okay. It's not something that I go around bragging about, but mm -hmm. I will tell people, you know, if, if someone's making your life hell, it's probably the only way they're going to learn, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when I told the teachers countless times, the school wasn't a good school, 
But it's one of the best things that happened to me. The school I went to after that was probably the best place I've been in my life. They supported my boxing career, let me have time off competitions. I made some of my best friends there. I still talk to my old teachers from that school. So right. everything happens for a reason. It's a cliche thing to say, but it was definitely true in my case. What's up, people? If you're enjoying our content, give us a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and make sure you press that notification bell so you don't miss another episode. Was When you went to the new school... Were you 12 at the time when you went to the new school? I was school? 12, yeah. It was so like when a few you went months, to the new school, was, later. was it like, oh, there's a boxer coming to the school? Was it like you known as the last who did the boxing? Because again, I remember when I went to school, I'm, I'm a bit older than you, but when I went to school, there was not many girls. In fact, I don't know a single girl who did boxing then. So if there was certainly a girl who came out of school, all the lads would have been like, I, he's, a, he's a bird who's going to start fighting people and that. And all the lads would have been, you know what I mean? It would have been a good, good crack. Um, what was it like for you then when you got into that school? Pretty much exactly how you said there. Um, obviously, rumours and stuff, you know, how, you know how things go amongst kids, 12, 13 year olds. So when I got to the school, I had a group of people come up to me asking if I'd killed someone with a hockey stick. You know? And I was like, no, it wasn't, wasn't that deep. I just <laughs> hit her a few times, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think a few people were a bit frightened and stuff, but like, I'm a very chilled out person. Like I say, I'm, it's very hard to offend me or make me angry. Mm -hmm. um, I love making friends. I love being social and talking to people and I'm quite calm. Um, so it, it, I think people realise quickly that I'm actually a nice person and I just did something that I kind of had to do at the time. Were you getting in the boxing gym at that age and when you start your new school? So obviously from 12 onwards, were you still in gyms and stuff? Were you, were you doing bits of training and stuff like that, boxing related or? Yeah, yeah, obviously like growing up, like I said to you before, doing bits of silly pads with my dad. Mm -hmm. um, after that, we did taekwondo. So I had my first taekwondo fight, I think I was six. Mm -hmm. And I did that through to the age of 13. So my boxing and taekwondo career kind of overlapped. Um, but yeah, taekwondo, like we spoke about before, got like a bit political and stuff. So wanting to focus on boxing. Um, so I started properly going to like boxing gyms and things when I was like, I think I was eight or nine, going to boxing gyms. And back then, very different, you know, mm -hmm. going into a gym as a girl. There was no other girls involved in it. It wasn't even in the Olympics then. So what was it, what was it like though? I know there was no other girls involved, but how did you actually fail going in them environments? Because like, in the normal, like not a boxing gym, but in a normal gym setting, I know the first time I stepped foot in an actual gym just to try and lift weights, for instance. Even me as a man, I felt a little bit intimidated. I was like, bloody hell, there's loads of these bodybuilders kicking around and these burly ass gadgets. And I felt a little bit like, Ugh, don't know what I'm doing. But then I, obviously as I just stuck at it and kept going, I actually found that a lot of them same people were very supportive. Like, you want to do it this, you want to do that. Try doing it this way. This is how you improve your form. Da -da -da. And then I started actually loving that whole thing. Uh, and it's something I still do today. With you, how were you kind of embraced as a female in the boxing gym? Um, I think in my case, it was a little bit different. Um, I think a lot of stereotypes were still held then. You know, boxing's a man's sport, should only be done by men. You get men that say, oh, you should be in the kitchen, you should be doing the laundry and stuff. Um, obviously, I was a kid, I was kind of too young to understand that whole thing. But for me, um, I wasn't kind of discriminated against badly. You know, I wasn't like treated badly or anything like that. It was just uh, a lot of coaches and things were surprised when I turned up for sparring. Me and my dad, like nine year old, they'd look at me and be like, "Well, she's a girl." I'd be mm -hmm. like, "Yeah, last time I checked, I was, but I'm just here for some sparring, you know." And they'd be like, "Well, we don't really," uh, uh, but they'd always let me, you know. They weren't like, "No, you're not sparring, get out." They'd always kind of include me and stuff. So, mm -hmm. like I say, I was never discriminated against or experienced any like prejudice through being a girl. It was just like a bit of an initial, like, "Oh God, oh, what do we do here?" I suppose in, in, a, in a weird way, though, like it's almost you've got the advantage as well because you're probably one of the only or the only female. So it's almost like when George is in the gym, people know George is in the gym. Do you know what I mean? So it's almost like you're probably going to get more attention and stuff, which can't be a bad thing, especially if you've got the talent to back it up. It's only going to go in your favor. Um, obviously, going through the years of, of being in and around the gym environment and stuff, when did you start to think, actually, do you know what? I want to take this a bit more seriously. Or when did you realise that you actually had not just some passion for, but an actual talent for? I think um, boxing, obviously, I was talented at Taekwondo. I won three British titles. That was initially like the plan to go to the Olympics to do Taekwondo. And I had that dream since I was six, since I had my first fight. Um, but boxing, I think I started taking it seriously when it got introduced at the Olympics in 2012, it was, wasn't it? Um, and kind of seeing like Nicola Adams, Katie Taylor, like I was mm -hmm. like, wow, I want to be like them. I want that to be me when I'm old enough. So other than just wanting it, was there a, who was the people around you then saying, actually, there is something there though, that like, maybe you could live out these dreams. When did you realise that boxing wasn't just like a fantasy, it was something that you could potentially do for a living? Well, we used to go around gym sparring and stuff. And at the time, like I 
used to hold my own, if not get the better of lads that were like two, three, four years older than me at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that shocked a lot of people, you know, like the lads used to kind of start out going easy on me and I'd like hit them and they'd be like, oh God, like chicken hit a bit. And like their caution and stuff would say like, you know, you've got a real talent, like you should try and pursue it, you know, keep away from the streets and, and pursue that goal that you've got. And the more I heard that, the more that was all I wanted to do. Did you ever feel like when you were sparring with lads that they would, you know, hold back a little bit or not? Like, do, or do lads just go for it still? Sometimes, it depends on the person. Some lads kind of held back to start with. I used to say like, no, like hit me, like try and hit me, you know, I'm not here to mess around. Um, but some lads will just try and knock my head off from the, from the get-go. What do you prefer? <laughs> the, the latter. Do you? Yeah. That's mad, that like. It's mad. Where do you think you get that from? Like, there's no fear? Like, I'm, I'm a bloke and I didn't want to get punched in the face. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, where do you get the, like, where do you get that fearlessness about, like, where does that come from? I think the mindset I have, I think, being a boxer, like, obviously, being sparring, fighting, the worst thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to get hit. And you're going to get hit anyway, regardless of who I'm sparring, regardless of the level. I'm going to get hit at least once in the spa. So I just think, why would I worry? I'm going to get hit. Just, just deal with it. Just hopefully I don't break my nose or black my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember when you started getting to the point where, you know, I understand so the, the, the kind of talent's being established. You kind of know people are, you know, you're sparring against these people around different gyms and stuff. You're holding your own. You're piercing lads all hour. Was the kind of like, did that, you know, when you said initially about your dad, how he would just want you to protect yourself. Did you then feel the shift in actually Georgia? I want you to make this happen now. Or was it a case of still just, as long as you're protecting yourself, I'm happy? Um, the latter, to be honest, he would like never put any pressure on me. He was like, no, you need to do this. You need to like be a superstar. You need to go here, you need to go here. He just said, as long as you keep training. He said, I want you to keep, keep training. As long as you enjoy it. He said, just do it for you. Don't do it for me or anyone else. He said, you do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And obviously I've always wanted to do it. And like, obviously you get to the age of like 13, 14, your friends start hanging around the streets and stuff. And it just never really appealed to me like going out and being involved in all that. And people would say, like, my friends, like, oh, you're missing out. Like, you should come out drinking and doing this. And I never felt like I was missing out because I loved boxing. And yeah. when I came home from school and go to the gym, that was my free time. And that's what gave me, like, happiness was, was going to the gym and boxing. So Did I you ever felt... do that? Like, did you ever go out on the streets or ever? No, never. Not once? Not you once. never drank no, in a park? I never drank in a park. Or, no, I was never having Frosty Jack's a three-litre cider in a park. I never, uh, never did it. How do you know about it? <laughs> been, in, been in group chats on a Blackberry Messenger back in the day uh, why are we even invited in the group chats going I don't on? <laughs> I'm on it I'm on it when you're up. but in terms of that though do you, so even to now obviously looking back it's great that you chose the path that you chose because obviously where, where you're going and obviously you can clearly tell that you've got your head screwed on as well you're not like one of these who just kind of don't really care you've, you've obviously obviously had your your own priorities and your own ambitions at the forefront of that that's been your main focus as opposed to going out anti-social activities in in you know parks or street corners did any of your friends at the time like go against you when you wanted to pursue boxing were they a bit like nah she's a bit boring was that ever a thing or was it not definitely yeah um but friends obviously not true friends I, I think true friends support you no matter what you go through in life your hardships your good times the goals you want to pursue a true friend will stick by that no matter what won't they mm-hmm. so when these friends kind of said, oh, you're boring now, like we don't want anything to do with you and kind of turned against me. A lot of people kind of behind my back most of the time would try and say like sneaky things, like obviously being in boxing or like George was a man, stuff like that, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I never let it get to me because I knew that I was doing something with my life and I knew that it would pay off and I knew that I would go on and inspire kids whereas they were just, just wasting their life, if anything. But yeah, I definitely had that like um, kind of friends falling off the... Of the bandwagon. And did that bother you at all? Like deep down, did it bother you and them friends kind of? Because was there any part of you where you thought, you know, like maybe that, maybe I am missing out a little bit, or was that never a case where you truly like that? Is it? I'm this. I'm I'm goal driven. I don't want to be involved with that. Or was there a little part of you where you're like, do you know what? Actually, maybe they're right. Honestly speaking, there was never a little bit where I thought, oh, they're right. I'm missing out. It just. The thought of going out drinking and like going with different boys and stuff, it just gave me like a, like a feeling of dread and anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I knew that that wasn't the kind of life I wanted to live. Mm-hmm. And I knew that if I did that, I would end up regretting it. Like whilst I'm sitting here talking to you, looking back over the years, I knew mm-hmm. it would be a regret. But in terms of like feeling sad, yeah, of course I felt a bit sad at that age. You lose your friends, you have arguments with your friends. It does give you that sinking feeling. But I knew that my boxing came first. 
Uh, that's, that, I, I'll give you credit for that. Like, I think that's amazing of you um, to be able to sit here and, and kind of say what you what you did and what you were like and how where you are now kind of is a true reflection of that. And not, it's not just like bullshit, if you know what I mean, um, which I appreciate and I think that's mint. Um, with, with you sort of really getting known, because obviously your name's around the boxing world now and a lot of people know who you are. When did that, when did that come? Was it the, the whole boxer situation? When, when did your name kind of get to that level? Well, I boxed for um, Team GB as an amateur. I kind of my amateur career kind of took off when I was fifteen. Um, I won my first national title, medal at the Europeans. Um, then I went on to win medals at World Championships and stuff. I only kind of lost to like top level, like world champions, European champions, and uh, did the Russians. Commonwealth and all, wasn't it? I won the Commonwealth yes. Games, yeah, the Youth Commonwealth in two thousand seventeen. Mm -hmm. So I think my name was around a bit in the amateur scene then. Um, I turned pro when I was 21, I signed my pro contract. Mm -hmm. I kind of had a few like years at GB where it wasn't, it didn't have that same spark. I kind of fell out of love with the sport a bit, not completely. I still trained and still kept that dedication, but I just felt like I maybe wasn't given the attention I kind of deserved down there and I was kind of pushed aside. So mm. that did make me kind of like rethink what I wanted to do. And I never had ambitions to turn pro, you know, I've always like, kept my hand in with education. I thought, oh, maybe it's time to get an academic career now, focus on that, maybe try and do something with my music. Um, but yeah, the opportunity came to turn pro. I took it with both hands and here I am. I want to talk about the music stuff and, and all that other good stuff soon, but with the whole Team GP, GP, Team GP, can I say it? With the Team GB stuff, um, how did that feel? What was training like around that? Um, do you mean like down in Sheffield? Yeah, like how yeah, yeah. Because a lot of people say it's like, I mean, I've heard different stories about, about that, but the training sort of regime and what kind, what was your day-to-day -day life like then? A lot of running, which mm -hmm. uh, I'm not keen on. Um, but it felt kind of isolated at times. Obviously, I had my friends and stuff down there, but a lot of people, like I don't want to say too much, but a lot of people on GB as well kind of lived that second lifestyle of narcotics and yeah. not doing naughty things and engaging with the opposite sex. And again, I never wanted to do any of that. So even then I felt like a bit of an outcast. Mm -hmm. And some of my friends down there were going off with the lads and, oh, let's go out tonight on the drink. And I'd be like, no, we've got to run tomorrow. It's seven in the morning. The last thing I wanted to do was going down mm -hmm. bloody prism in uh, Sheffield uh, and, uh, and getting on it. Do you know what I mean? Uh, um, so yeah, even then I kind of felt like a bit of an outcast. But the training itself, I, like I enjoy training anyway. That's what makes me feel good. So I love the training. Mm -hmm. Like I love the spa and love the pads. And as much as I don't like running, when it was done, I felt good. But so I like the training. Turning pro, right? What did that truly feel like? Can you remember? Um, it all kind of came about just really fast, to be honest. Like I say, I never had like real intentions to turn pro. Um. I went up to the gym with my uh, Italian friend and um, met my manager at the time then. And uh, he said, have you ever thought about turning pro? And I kind of had a look into it. And I spoke to my dad and I thought, maybe this could be a good thing, you know. I could make like a few quid out of it, but also get out there and get my story out there for the people to see. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of waiting for the Olympics, being on Team GB, and that's if I get to the Olympics, they might choose someone else to go to the qualifiers. Yeah. Waiting four years for that to get on the television once. I could be on the television potentially twice, three times a year and have like newspapers, like newspaper articles written about me. It's getting my story out, which is my main goal and what I want to do. Mm -hmm. How much of that, of getting your story out, getting seen, being on TV and stuff, because I know you've mentioned music as well. How much of what you do, once, like, is it about Georgia O'Connor becoming someone or is it about Georgia O'Connor just becoming a great boxer? Do you know what I mean? Are you after a profile, a status, a name? Do you want to be in the public eye? Or is it purely about the talent and the art itself? I wouldn't say it's purely about the talent and the art boxing itself. It's, for me, a big thing is inspiring the younger generation and kind of getting my story out for kids to see and realise that it doesn't matter what happens to you in life, you can have hardships, you can have bad times, you can feel lost and lonely and that you don't fit in, but not fitting in is often a good thing. It's good mm -hmm. to be different. I love that. Like, I feel like that's been very similar to my journey. Not that I've ever dabbled in the boxing world, like, but um, it's definitely been something that I feel like in my friendship groups and stuff, I feel like I've often been the the outsider, if you like. Um, and it's why I get to have these lovely conversations with people like yourself, because no one I grew up with are doing this. Do you know what I mean? So, and, and as long as we're all happy, that's the main thing. Um, when you talked about like hardships and stuff then, um, 
I want to actually touch on that again because I think a lot of people will say George O'Connor on Instagram where you blue tick before you could. I think you had a blue tick before you could even pay for them, didn't you? I did, I, yeah, yeah. you did. It took uh, me a lot, to, a lot of chew to get it like, but I got there in the end. <laughs> so, like, when you were kind of that girl and you're kind of getting seen and stuff, like, a lot of people will say the highlight reel, will say the Instagram and stuff. And what were your lower times like, or when you talk about adversity or hardships and stuff? Have you, can you remember a time when you've been particularly low, felt like an outsider? Oh, definitely. Um, so, before I turned professional in February 2021, a few days before my 21st birthday, I suffered um, multiple pulmonary embolisms on my lungs, right. which is basically blood clots on my lungs. Just a complete freak accident. It's, I've, I've never smoked. Like I say, I don't drink. I drink maybe once, twice a year, special occasions. Always kept myself fit and healthy. So, this was kind of just a proper freak accident. Um, I remember having like pains in my side. And I, I remember saying to my mum and dad, Mum, dad, like I've got these horrible pains in my side when I breathe in it hurts my, my heart's going rapid and they said oh you might have just like overstretched your intercostal muscle like training and stuff because at the time I was like practicing going southpaw mm-hmm. right. and I thought oh maybe I've just pulled like the muscles between my ribs um that was the Monday the Thursday it was unbearable I felt like I was gonna die I couldn't breathe like I was sweating and it was just a horrible experience my mum took me to hospital um I kind of passed out my blood pressure I remember was 70 over 40 um, and could have lost my life. They said if I left it any longer, just got to hospital in time. And what was it though? Like, what were, what are they like? How are they caused? Them things on your lungs? They normally start in your leg, which is called a DVT, deep vein thrombosis, and right, okay. they can travel from your leg. They can go to your heart, your lungs, or your brain. And I mean, right, I'm with you. God, like, thank God they didn't go to my heart or my brain because that would normally kill you. I mean, the, the kills I think half of people when they do go to your lungs before they find out what it is. So it was literally 50-50 that I would live or die. Did they ever get a reason why you got, or was it just a genetic thing? Just a... My mum's had them twice, so we do think it's a genetic thing. Right, okay. Um, like I say, I never smoked or did anything to like kind of aggravate them. It's just, it just happened. And you've been fine ever since? Yeah, I've been fine. My lung capacity is, I think, like five and a half litres, they say. So. You, know what, you know what blows my mind, though? It's like people like you who've, and that's the thing, like, I mean, don't get me wrong, you're still here and you're healthy and that's the main thing. But like when you look at people like you've have always chosen like the healthier side in life and you've pushed yourself and you've trained and you've said no to the drugs and the smoking and drinking in parks and stuff. And then you've had things like that, which could have wiped you out at the age of what, 20 at the time. Like it just, it just goes to show like part of me thinks you've just got to do what you want to do in life. Do you know what I mean? It's not always about like, like if, if, if dedicating yourself to a craft makes you happy, that's great. If, Drinking in parks makes you happy. Then, it, do you know what I mean? Obviously, just whatever you want to do, just as long as you're happy. I mean, I had a conversation with your dad, didn't I, about just before the podcast about like work life balance and stuff. And like, if if work and loads is what you enjoy, then that's your balance and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that's really important, actually, especially in boxing, because you see a lot of people who are pushing themselves to the extremes. But we both know they probably wouldn't be doing that if they didn't want that thing enough. And if that thing is what derives their happiness from, then why not go for that? Do you know what I mean? Um, you mentioned music. So I know that obviously you play the guitar. I didn't actually know you sung as well. Um, how did that come? Is that something you did since you were a kid? Yeah. Um, my dad like plays the guitar. So he kind of taught me what he knew. I kind of, I was about nine at the time. I kind of got a bit better than him uh, and he got me a teacher. So I learned all the, you know, all the fast Jimi Hendrix riffs and all those, that kind of stuff. And it's always, I've always loved music. It's always been kind of like my escape from the world. I know it mm-hmm. sounds dead cliche to say that, but music really does make you feel things if you really listen, take it in. And mm-hmm. even just going for a walk, you've got music on, it changes the whole kind of the feeling of it, doesn't it? Does, it does, doesn't it? Aye, that's right. Uh, you are running, you know, you put uh, your favourite song on and suddenly you can run two miles an hour faster. <laughs> Thing is, can you run without music? No. <laughs> no, it's horrendous. <laughs> like, it's horrible, isn't Impl- it? I hate the feeling when you pull up to the gym and you realise you forgot your headphones. Drive no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gone. I'm, <laughs> Drive I'm no. done. Right, I'm on the pizza shop. I'm gone. Home. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Done. We'll start next it's a week. It's write off. <laughs> no, that's meant that. Like, with everything else in terms of like you being a female, right? What would you say the hardest thing about being a female in boxing is? Because I know that it's getting, you know, it's, it's right in the line right now. There's people who are doing massive things in boxing, like yourself, um, which is amazing for the sport. You're getting more young lasses into the sport, which is brilliant. Again, more people defending themselves, more people, you know, with that kind of discipline, which is amazing. And, more people who are going on to successful uh, lives in terms of finance as well. What's the hardest thing about being a girl in boxing? I think a lot of men, it tends to be like the older generation of men, they'll kind of say kind of derogatory things, you know, make comments about your appearance. Not, not like derogatory, but just 
say things like, oh, she's hot and stuff. And I'm not one to be like offended by that, but I think she should be focusing on the boxing. Yeah. Not yeah. like what someone looks like. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. And I think people kind of like say like stuff like, oh, I would and oh, this and that. And it's like, just concentrate on the boxing, man. Do you know what I mean? Right. There's, there's times and places to say that and sites you can go on <laughs> to, uh, to uh-huh. gratify that, that, that part of yourself. But, you know, just if you're watching the boxing, just watch yeah. it. Just watch it. Like, I'm a, I'm a boxer, not a a woman boxer to be looked at and objectified you know what i mean it's just just enjoy the boxing that's the thing i think that's the main thing to to say that you you know you are a boxer the the you know what i mean regardless of being a female but the reason i ask that is because for one it's a predominantly it was a male sport boxing i know that obviously women are getting into it more and more and i think it's brilliant for the sport because it's why not if you can showcase your skill and you can and it's class to see some last slapping a lad all hour in the gym I think it's funny as out do you know what I mean because it is it's like it's great to, it's great to show that actually you know we can all hold our own here it's about that it's about dedicating what we've put into the craft to kind of display it on stage what's your actual goal with boxing my goal in terms of what I want to be I would love to be a world champion that's my goal unified if I if I can mm. um so that's like in terms of like belts and things, world champion, nothing less. But more of a personal goal with boxing, like I, like I was saying to you before, I get messages sometimes from kids and kids' parents saying, oh, like my little girl or my little boy stood up for himself today and he said he read about what you did and he wanted to do the same. And That's stuff amazing, like that, it's priceless. I mean, world, having a world title and being sat here with a belt one day would be amazing, but that's like having a direct impact on an individual's life in a positive way. And people don't forget that, do they? I mean, there'll be a time, hopefully hopefully not for, like, not for a long, long time, but there'll be a time when I die and like my story's done then. Like I'm dead, I, I can't do anything more. But the things that I've done for the people will live on. And mm. I just want to do that as much as I can and just leave a positive impact on the world. And that's the thing, like even if Touchwood, your career was then today, you've already you've already did that. You know what I mean for kids? You've already did that for people who have messaged you. So you've already changed lives. Like that's the sh- that's the shit that gets me. Like, I know of course we want you to have a long life, but but if even if something tragic did happen, you've already instilled that. I think that's again you've got to be proud of yourself. For that. That's just that's just phenomenal. Like, no, honestly, I mean that. Like, because when you look at it like that, when you say that, like, it just goes to show that there's people out there who are probably changed, and you're probably not even you're probably not even aware of it now because you're doing your own thing but there's probably kids out there who are doing something completely different now just because of you and even them are the people who've messaged you imagine the people who haven't and see you and as well there's that there's that as well which i think is phenomenal um in terms of obviously getting somewhere with boxing right and actually growing your profile and stuff like that how important do you think social media is for a boxer to have i think especially in the last few years it's became like increasingly important um like Professional boxing itself is a business. You can be the most fantastic boxer in the world, but if you're boring, you can't talk, then mm-hmm. no one's really interested, are they? Um, so I think like what you what you guys do and stuff with this is fantastic. And like I say, I'm extremely grateful to have this opportunity to share my story and grow my profile on like on social media. No, you're welcome anytime. I mean, you look at some some of the, the biggest guys on social, you look at like of Ryan Garcia and stuff like that, like what they do with Instagram and things like the way I look at it is, if you can build up some kind of profile, you're going to be more appealing to brands, opportunities outside of boxing. We all know that unless you're at the top of the top, there's, there's not a big deal of money in boxing either, really. So, like, if you're a guy who's, you know, he's lacing up his boots and he's going to his local gym and he's punching a bag all hour and he's gone home and he's, you know, he's he's struggling, basically, but, he, but he's talented. Unless you get there and get the recognition, right place, right time, and get those opportunities, how do you survive? But well, I'll tell you how, it's obviously growing your social because if you can get some kind of brand deal to support you in your goals, and that's, that's definitely a way you can do that. So yeah, you may not become world champion, but you can facilitate your dreams of becoming a boxer, which could lead on to any kind of, of belt or whatever you want to achieve in it. But also, more importantly, you've got enough money to sustain yourself while you're doing what you love. And I think that's really important as well. It's very similar with what I do with the content PT business, Georgia. So... I do what I love every day, genuinely. And I mean, I make no money at all from this podcast that I do. However, what I will say is me position, me business is at a position now where I can afford to do a podcast. And I think that's something I've always wanted to do. Um, and that's, I just know that if you do something you love and you can get funded for it or you can, you can make money from it, i.e. what I do with creating content for people, 
then I can do the thing I love to do, which is podcasting. And it's the same as a boxer. If they can get, you know, some kind of sponsorship deal while they're training to become a boxer, then why not do that? And I, and I do feel like a lot of boxers now want social media content. Um, but I do feel like the more podcast people come on, I feel like the more social media content that they create, I think it can only be bigger and better for the brand um, of the fighter. What's your... Obviously, you've just signed with Conlon Boxing. What was your kind of deal running up to that in terms of what was the reason you went with, with Conlon? What was the reason? I mean, why were you at the previous place you were at? And what kind of future do you have with Conlon? So obviously I was signed with Sky Sport and Boxer and I'm grateful for all the memories and the three fights I had with them. But I kind of felt like I was just being pushed aside and treated like, uh, how do you say, like a second choice. Mm -hmm. It was like shows that asked to go on and stuff and I was kind of given notice for fights at like two weeks notice and stuff. And like you say, everyone's got to live. Everyone's got to have that work-life balance. There was a time where I couldn't book any holidays and that's my thing for me. I love going on holiday, traveling, experiencing new cultures and things. Couldn't do that for a long period of time because I didn't know am I boxing, am I not? Oh, you're boxing here. Oh, no, you're not boxing anymore. This has been moved. And I thought, like, God, I just need some kind of schedule to get mm -hmm. my life in order. Um, so I kind of, like, decided to leave Sky. I didn't feel like I was getting... Not, not, not like, getting, not getting what I deserve, but I don't feel like I could have fulfilled my potential to the fullest with them. Mm -hmm. um, so when Sam got in touch, obviously, Sam started being my manager... He said, um, obviously because of my surname, he said, do you have any Irish in you? Uh, now, my great-grandfather, so my dad's grandfather, was born in County Leitrim in Ireland, um, mm. came over here for work. Um, so I, said, I explained that. He said, oh, because I've got a really good opportunity for you here if you do want it with Conlon Boxing, mm. boxing over in Ireland. And I thought, do you know what? Why not? If things like um, Boxer, Sky, Matchroom, they've got loads of lasses and a lot of them only fight maybe twice, three times a year if they're lucky. Yeah. I, don't, I don't believe Conan Box and have any other females apart from obviously me now. And I thought, why not just take a leap of faith and go and do something completely different? I'm going back to my roots and just a whole new kind of lease of life kind of thing. So I said yes. And the way I look at it as well, you could potentially kind of, it's like a fresh start, isn't it? And you can kind of rebuild or, or continuously grow the, your existing audience, if you like, you, you know, everyone who's following you and really build that up over there because there's going to be a lot of Irish who tune in here as well because I think, I think obviously how they are with their heritage and stuff, I think that would be really nice. It's like a nice story, isn't it, for you to go back yeah. over there kind of to follow your yeah. brand, you know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of, so it's really nice. That's really cool. I think that'll be, I think you'll build up a lot of um, following over there as well. Um, when are you going to be fighting next? 4th of August, so two weeks yesterday. That's at uh, Falls Park in Belfast. Bloody hell. So I really can't wait for that. It's like, on a Friday, Friday the it's Friday, yeah. Friday like before. you see, Irish people are very proud of the heritage. I'm very proud of my Irish heritage. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell everyone that. So I, I do believe I'll be liked over there as long as I conduct myself correctly. question and, is, how proud are you if you don't drink Guinness? I do like a Guinness twice a year. -ish. Just twice a year? Twice a year, a half. On Paddy's Day? Yeah. Oh, that's, sound, that's, <laughs> that's enough, isn't it? <laughs> ah, of course it is. I know that you've got a job in construction. Well, you're a, you're a trainee, quantity Quantly severe. severe yeah. Um, what was the reason for that as well? Because obviously I know that you're a pro boxer. Now, not many pro boxers are going to have full-time jobs. I mean, there, there is the odd few. What's the reason that you do that? For me, I've always kind of been stressed about the importance to have a backup plan. And it's not like, oh, plan A might fail, so you need to have a plan B. It's just, in life, I feel like it's important to have as many assets, as many strings to your bow, so to speak, that you can have. So obviously I've got my music. My boxing's the main thing, but I've got my music as well to fall back on. And I've got an academic career now. And um, I've always been a bit of a geek at school and stuff. I had like good grades and I'd like, I liked to study. I was probably the only person in the school that liked reading and studying poetry, mm -hmm. which is a bit sad, but <laughs> there we are. Um, so yeah, my, my dad as well. And my mum and dad always said, you know, don't just do one thing. Try and do as much as you can. As long as you manage your time well and you don't feel stressed, do what you can. That's the main thing, like, isn't it? I mean, there's two ways to look at that because I would also say it, it's good to sort of dedicate yourself to one thing to be the master of that rather than spread yourself in. But again, if you say you can manage your time, I mean, professional boxer and quantity severe is going to be a canny yeah. clash. Like eventually, I imagine it would be. Um, but again, if you're great at managing time, that's amazing. What's it like? Obviously, you've got a, a partner as well, and I want to mention that as well for from his point of view. I know you can't speak for him, but for you, 
What's it like to have a partner when you are a female boxer? Because again, you've said there you're going to get a lot of people, you know, lads who are drinking in the crowd, seeing daft things and, and stuff like that. What's it like to kind of have that to kind of battle? Because I can imagine from a lad's perspective how that would be. But what's it like for, for a woman in boxing? Um, my boyfriend, bless him, he's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I met him when I was 21, two years ago. Mm-hmm. He's the only man I've ever been with. Mm-hmm. And getting back to like kind of keeping away from lads when I was younger and stuff, I'm so grateful that I did wait. Uh, I know it sounds cliche. I always wanted to wait for the right one. Yeah, yeah, and I course. didn't want to give like a part of myself to someone who'd be like in the pub looking at the telly saying, oh, I've been with her, you know. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. he's a really special person and he definitely has my heart. And he's just always there, you know. I was kind of scared one day that I would fall in love with someone who'd be like, oh, don't go to the gym, Georgia. Like, I don't want you being around men. He's just dead chilled about everything. And That's he's, he's always way. there supporting me. He gets on very well with my mum and dad as well. And mm-hmm. I'm just really grateful to have him. I think you need that as well. I think regardless, I think you need a partner who is going to give you the support. And I think that it's not even about anything else at this point. It's the support is the biggest thing. Uh, I certainly found that as well. I know a lot of, well, all of my business, I call my missus the content PT. I think she's the one who, you know, is let's like facilitates this because ultimately without that support, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. And it's very hard when you've got your own business. And I, and I, I imagine it's the same as being a boxer in that respect. Like it, it can be quite lonely, you know, as, as an entrepreneur or a boxer, because you, you are, you, you traveling around, you train on your own. There's a lot of stuff where you are on your own as well. Um, and even you're in your head on your own quite a bit as well, because they don't have to deal with, some of the things you will have to deal with on your own. So I think that's massive. Like, I really do think it's that. Um, is a family something you'd want as well? Is Absolutely that, that... one day, yeah. I think I would have to be done with boxing. Mm-hmm. I, had, I really admire people like Tasha Jonas who've like had a child well, and then I... got back to boxing. I think for me, I would want to be done with it. I'd want to spend, I think, every week and moment with, with my kids as much as I can. But it's definitely something for the future. But mm-hmm. I'm not thinking about it right now. I've got, a, got things to do. <laughs> if, if boxing was to end for you, for whatever reason, touch wood, um, what would you do? Would it just be the, the surveying? I'd maybe try and push my music a bit more. To be honest, that's a bit dormant at the minute. I am very busy, obviously, training, uh, working full-time, so I don't really have time to kind of practice that and push that out. I think I would maybe try and do something with that um, and definitely just keep working and try and get to the highest point I can in my career. But, yeah, I hear a lot of boxers, like, like it's all they do and then when it ends they kind of lose their minds because they've put all the passion into this one thing and then it's gone and then, then what do you do it's 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 like lost then isn't it so yeah. I think it'll definitely help me like obviously boxing's a short lived career I'm going to have to retire one day whether I like it or not you've got to listen to your body haven't you Yeah. Um, but I think I'll be alright hopefully I won't lose my head I'll have other things to do I reckon as long as you get in now by the time you're 30 you know what I mean I mean I'm not putting a timeline on you but I think if you do that that's probably a mint age for a woman to then go on and have a family oh, and stuff as well. And then you've made a shitload of money. I've always said around, around like late 20s, early 30s would be yeah, perfect. So. I think that would be amazing. That like, Do you plan on moving to Ireland? Is that your plan now? With Or is it just, you're just going to go there and fight? I'm just going to go there and fight. I mm-hmm. mean, maybe when I retire one day, when I'm in my 60s, 70s, <laughs> it would be nice to have a little cottage out there mm-hmm. in their peace and quiet. Um, but no, I don't plan on moving there. I like I like being here. No, that's amazing. Again, it's a lovely place where you live. So why would you? Um I was going to ask you, as a boxer, how hard is it to get sponsorship? Probably a lot harder than people think. Is you know, it? I could send out 100 emails and get two, two replies in one scene. So do no. you do your own outreach as well? Like, do you try and reach out to sponsors and stuff like that? Not too much, to be honest. Sometimes I feel a bit cheeky, you know, sending an email saying, like, please sponsor me. I feel a bit like, and, and money's tight at the minute. The cost of living's horrendous. So I feel a bit bad asking people, like, do you want to sponsor me? Like I'm lucky enough to be able to work and I don't, I don't struggle with money. I'm quite good with money. I've got a nice little savings account and things. So I do feel a bit cheeky asking people to sponsor yeah, me. Yeah, but I think it's important to do that though, because ultimately that's what it's all about. You, you need to get those sponsors on. What do you find hard about other than just feeling a bit cheeky? Like for other boxers as well, because I'm sure when people see you on the likes of Sky Sports Boxer, whatever it was, and then Conlon Boxing coming up in, from the 4th of August, like people would think George O'Connor, Instagram, blue tick, on the TV, she's fighting, she's putting people down, did everything she's did in her life, she's probably loaded. Sponsorship will be no bother at all. But what they don't say is, because I, I understand the game, but for people who are listening or watching and, you know, they're an aspiring boxer or, they, you know, they've got the first fight coming up and they just want some sponsorship to help them, like, what advice could you give them to attract that sponsorship? I would say just be yourself. For me, 
having sponsors is not about the quantity of sponsors, but the quality and how well they're suited to you. So the sponsors I do have, um, my company I work for actually sponsor me, Fortress Vision. So do they really? yeah, so I feel like a really close connection with but you them. You get like double salary, Woo-hey. pretty much. Yeah, it's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so for me, it's about having that like personal relationship with your sponsors as well. You're not just taking the money and then see you later. I'm out the door. Yeah. It's like you can go and have a chat, have a cup of tea. And they know you on a personal level. Mm-hmm. And I would say that's a lot better than just kind of, depending on who you are, some people just want the money, don't they? But for me, it's like, it's about making that connection with someone and sharing my story with them as well. Mm-hmm. So it like aligns with your values and stuff. So it sits right with you as a brand. You know what I mean? I think that's, I think that's, that's a really interesting take on it as well, because I'd be the same in terms of stuff like that, because I think what people see you doing in the public eye, they don't want you just like promoting a teeth whitening product. You know what I mean? The one something that's going to actually actively. Um, I know you've worked with food sponsors and stuff in the past as well, haven't you? So I think, I think, I think something like that was. Uh, it's really important to kind of show as well. The next, do you have a five-year plan? I have an idea of where I want to be in five years. Yeah. What is that? World champion. World champion in five years. I think that's doable. And do you have all the re- right people around you now that's telling you it's possible I believe so I'm a big believer and you don't need a lot of people you just need the right ones and I believe like my dad Sam Jones manager Conlon's it's all everything everything what I need is is there that's meant that for kids listening or watching Georgia and again I know that you're inspiring people I mean it's inspiring for me to just sit with you and have this conversation um, so I know that there'll be a lot of people kind of listening or watching and who are especially you I mean I've got a little sister and who knows, but when I look at people like that and I think, you know, cause I want her to do well. So I'll look and I'll look at people like you for like inspiration from like, look, like you need to be doing more of this or more of this. It doesn't have to be boxing, but there'll be things you can do. I mean, you've, you've showed you've got an, an absolute array of creative endeavors, which you could take up like your music, et cetera. Um, would you, would you recommend boxing? I would to anyone, even if you don't want to pursue it, professionally or if you want to don't want to go to the Olympics that's fine but I think for your confidence like in the people you meet within boxing it teaches you a discipline that I don't think can be taught anywhere else so mm-hmm. to any like any parents wanting to get the kids into something I would, I would recommend boxing to anyone who do you look up to in the boxing world there's a few I like Katie Taylor obviously mm-hmm. she's Irish mm-hmm. bit biased but what she's done for women's sport she's had a lot of hardships you know with her dad and stuff and she came out the other end and look what she's done I'd like um, some of the men as well, Gennady Golovkin, Vasil Lomachenko, kind of more for their style and the way they box rather than yeah. their story. But yeah, there's a lot of people I look up to. I believe that we can take something from everyone, no matter how big they've become or if they're unknown, I believe everyone's got their own little quirks and attributes that we can learn from. I think that's one of the biggest things. I had a conversation with um, Ben Davison, actually, and Ben's been on the podcast, actually, and Ben actually said one of the biggest things is if the person's coachable or not. Even if the most talented fighter in the world, if they don't want to be coached or they don't want to learn, he doesn't really want to work with them. And I think that's so right what you've just said. Like, you can learn from someone who's not even known. And I think that's that kind of humility to have. I think that's really important because especially even like with what I do, right, filming and stuff and, and creating content for people, I'll I'll come across a content creator who he's, he hasn't got a follow on Instagram or anything like that, but he'll show us a technique where I'm like, it blows your mind. I'm like, actually, it's no point in me saying to him, no, this is how you do it because this is what makes money. It's actually, no, that creative flair which you have is something I can definitely learn from. And I think that's really important. Um, But I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Georgia. What I don't want to do is ask you too much because I do want a part two with you if you'd be happy to come on down the line. Obviously, I want you to go over to Ireland and smash this, smash this all over the place. And um, when you come back, obviously... And we'll we'll speak together. We'll get together again in a few months' time and see what we can do. But um, thank you so much for coming on the show. I want to say a huge thank you to you for travelling here as well. It means the world, honestly. And uh, I wish you all the best in your in all your endeavours. And no, it's definitely, uh, we'll definitely do a part two. Appreciate it. Do you want to give a shout out to anybody or anything like that? Or if anyone wants to find you on social media, is there anything like that you want to shout out? Yeah. So my Instagram is George O'Connor underscore one. Um, I have like a public Facebook page you can follow. It's George O'Connor. Uh, Twitter I don't really use much but it's Geo underscore Connor and uh, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to my sponsors Fortress Vision and my uncle Andrew Williams Groundworks Perfect, thank you, cheers for your time Thank you Cheers